Neil, it's nice to see you. And it is pronounced Neil, not Neil, right? It is just Neil, exactly, yeah. Always confusing for me. Um, Neil, it's uh, it's good to have you on the Evolve and Play podcast. Um, you and I got to meet this summer, spent some time jumping around at Hempstead Heath. Uh, so it was fun to see. And I've been watching your kind of uh, iteration of, I guess, movement culture uh, from afar on your Instagram and in the way that you've incorporated. You know, I, I think you're kind of like, what is it, like third gen now? Like they're uh, of of sort of movement teachers who've come through this space and are adding their own unique flavor to it. So yeah, it's been really fun to see the work you're doing. I got a chance to look through some of your programs um, leading up to this. So for folks who are not familiar with you, can you just tell us a little bit about uh, your background and kind of where you're focused as a teacher? And, you know what, what what kind of work you do. Yeah, definitely. So first off, thank you for, very much for inviting me. Uh, excited to be here and to yeah to share a chat. And yeah, basically what I do is I've been moving through various practices so far. One of the longest ones has been skateboarding for me, which is like already way, way back. I started when I was 10, 11 years old. And then th through like different years, I went through CrossFit. I went through uh, like more the strength side of training and more the playful side um, but then eventually found my way more and more into acrobatics and uh, all that acrobatics can be and I guess for the past eight years nine years or something I've been much more uh, invested in this type of practice and researching what it is what it can be for me um, and also throughout all of these different practices that I've been doing as I've also been teaching different things now like my core has always been connecting uh, a person to his body or her body and seeing what is possible then. And um, I've been doing that in CrossFit back then. I've been doing that in strength training. And now I'm doing it more and more in acrobatics or however you want to call the things that I'm that I'm doing currently, which is also a mix of, of different practices kind of like formed together. Um, but I guess acrobatics can be a very nice title for the the sum of what I'm doing, I guess. So um, did you kind of start professionally as a teacher right away at the beginning of your adult life in CrossFit or how did you, how did you find yourself into teaching physical mm. and uh, capacities? It was even before CrossFit. It was now, I think, 11 years ago. Um, I basically went to this um in in german we call it a verein it's basically a, a place where people can publicly walk in and there's different departments from fitness to boxing basically two 23 different sports and uh, i was like training there at this like more health oriented gym atmosphere type thing and the trainer back then he approached me and he he noticed that i'm really enjoying what i'm doing so he asked me if i could also train so that was 11 years ago and it was more about um elderly people connecting them with the body and doing some sort of training with them and uh, that that really is my start also in the professional thing which was before acrobatics before crossfit even yeah so you're probably in your late teens early 20s at that point exactly like 19 18 something like this i guess yeah 19 years old so the, you're, you're starting with essentially personal training and just general fitness exactly yeah um personal training uh, going around the you know, the gym and helping uh, the elders and like people with uh, injuries would come there a lot. It was not like a typical gym, you know, where people would like focus on bodybuilding or whatever or strength training it was really just getting to move, I guess. And how did you get into that practice? Was it via skateboarding or what What? What got you into the gym in the first place? Hmm. I guess, I mean, I've been doing training for years before that, like when I started, when I was probably 13, 14. Mm -hmm. And it was, I guess, like, honestly, it was some sort of like Dragon Ball oriented physique type of things that eventually led me to do like push-ups in my room or something. Mm -hmm. So it was really just uh, the joy of moving. I always had that since I, since I was growing up. And um, through a friend, he he then went to this gym and he told me it's nice because it's not your know, typical gymbo thingy thing, uh, but it's quite nice to to move and train a little bit. So that was, I think, the the starting point. Nice. So you you have a background with skateboarding. You just have a general 
curiosity about movement and you end up kind of in the industry and then you discover CrossFit. Can you tell me about how you discovered CrossFit and what kind of your your experience with CrossFit was? Yeah, sure. I guess um, the starting point, it was also a trainer back then. I could even say like a mentor in this gym that I was referring to. And he was already like, you know, there were elderly people training like very conservatively. And then there was this guy and he was swinging kettlebells and doing like crawling on the floor and climbing everything that he could climb. And I was intrigued, very intrigued because I'm very playful by nature. And then he he uh, he gave me some training programs to kind of like follow and was it was kind of like CrossFit training programs, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. And eventually together with him after a about a year or so training in the basement of this gym, very like old school environment. We then went together to see a CrossFit box. That's what they call them now, a CrossFit box. And uh, I guess CrossFit was really like, um, it. what intrigued me there was the more diverse nature of training as they focus a little bit of weightlifting, gymnastics, running and different things. And there would be seminars on running technique or whatever. And um, I, I think, I thought that was very cool and that was also like my mm -hmm. it resonated deeply with me because this is how I always moved a little bit of this a little bit of that and it, it made sense to me yeah generalist idea I wrote an essay recently about how I think that CrossFit was in a lot of ways the the rebirth of the generalist idea in movement culture um, or in fitness um, there's a lot of ways in which the early ideas of CrossFit sort of seeded the ground for a lot of what came later which mm. I think is kind of interesting and we figured about it now like all these things are sort of just part of the the culture you know we're used to the crossfit games and but it but it was pretty unique at the time and then i think it created the cultural space that that you know moved Nat and Ido Porsal and my own work and everybody else has sort of entered into um, so it's interesting to hear that you you had that background. I was also experimenting with CrossFit back in 2007, 2008. So did you go pretty deep into the CrossFit? Did you get to the point where you were, you know, trying to hit all the wads and get all the, like, you know, standard strength movements, you know, double body weight squat and all that stuff? I got infected by the virus for sure. Yeah, yeah. I was there. I was deep there. We had like a competition team in the CrossFit box and they asked me to join. I never really went to CrossFit competitions outside of the box, but like within the box, we had like competitions and everything and I would participate and I, I really enjoyed it. You know, all of the time uh, that I had, yeah, I put it there into CrossFit next to my studies and and like the strength um, staples that you would do or like uh, the gymnastic handstand walks and learning all of that. And then also, like you were saying, we had like little charts of two times body weight squatting and deadlifting and whatever it was. And I'd really try to check all of that. And uh, it for sure was a lot of fun. Yeah. 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 The strength standards, they were a big thing in CrossFit. Those were developed by Dave Werner, who uh, mm -hmm. founded CrossFit. I think it was CrossFit North. I, I can't remember the exact name, but it was, it was like the second or third CrossFit. Um, or maybe the first CrossFit affiliate, and it was in Seattle. And so um, we ended up having some small connection with them, and that that influenced the parkour community as well. Ryan Ford from Apex Movement ended up kind of trying to adapt the strength standards and um, offer them within the parkour community. Mm -hmm. so it's, been, it's been an interesting idea, and I, I definitely have pursued trying to achieve a lot of these things. Um, I was looking back on goals that I had from 2010 and mm -hmm. the, the <laughs> they're just ridiculous because there's so many of them, right? I'm trying to like get a, a 35 inch vertical leap and a, uh, you know, a four, six, 40 yard dash and a, a straddle plunge and a press to handstand and competing parkour. And I was like, <clears throat> you know, none of them are unachievable, but to try to, achieve that in a year or two across all of those different disciplines is uh, certainly absurd. Um, yeah. I remember like uh, always at New Year's, I would do that for, I think three years, I made like a huge list of all of the things that I wanted to achieve, very measurable. It's very different to uh, to what I'm doing right now, but 
Back yeah. then, it was really about the statistics, and it was also fun, you know, through the months trying to check all of the things. Yeah. Yeah, it, it gives a, you know, um, neurologically, that's great for kind of the, the dopamine system, right? Mm. Having really clear goals and, and being able to check off stuff. You have, uh, at, the, at that time, the parkour community, we were picking up the idea of SMART goals, specific, measurable, um, actionable, realistic, time sensitive, right? Mm hmm. I, I fell down on the realistic and kind of time, <laughs> right? What What is a reasonable amount of time to try to achieve both uh, a straddle plunge and, uh, you know, a double body weight squat? Because they're, they're not actually that closely related. And then to do that while also learning to sprint really fast. Um, for most people, it's it's probably not a year. No. For sure. You know, those things. So you you were doing CrossFit for a while and then you discovered was it actually Tom Wexler who was kind of your first um window into this more more movement direction, I suppose? Um not so much. I mean, through the CrossFit community, there was already this like opening up of of yeah. what I thought fitness was or whatever, right? And then, of course, I discovered Ido back then and already like I never learned from him or with him in one of the workshops, but obviously all of the videos and everything kind of like inspired me to to look a little bit broader at the things. And then uh, I've I've met Tom the first time in 2016. So already a couple of years ago, but it was not so much that he he introduced me to the more general side of movement or movement culture, or whatever you want to call it, it was more specific to his practice and specific to his art of acrobatics and dance and everything that he does so it was more uh, from this more general thing once again a little bit more specific uh, yeah. approach but he definitely was a very big or and still is a big uh, influence there yeah so you you encountered Ido in what 2014 something like that 2015 yes. and yeah. you know that was around the time that uh, I met you know, in 2011 and then mm -hmm. trained with them in, in 2012 and that I had been really thinking about parkour and natural movement sort of in a fitness perspective and but I was I mean <laughs> a lot of it was sort of building up that, that perspective wasn't quite didn't quite fit what I was trying to think about and I was also really influenced by play research at the time so I encountered Ido and his articulation of movement and fit really well with where I was going with, with my own practice. But by the, by 2014, 2015, you know, his name and the CrossFit community in particular, like a lot of people were, were, were sort of exiting CrossFit or exiting yoga and entering movement culture. Mm. How did you experience that kind of thing? Was there, was there a group of people in uh, Munich who were, sort of growing stale with the wads and starting to want to practice floreu and handstands and you know more advanced ring skills and acrobatics or how, how did you experience that call towards a, a different way of thinking about generals because you know stuff especially at that time was really focused on a general approach to movement in the same way that cross it's a general approach to fitness but the the, the flip from fitness to movement created a really distinct culture and of course it all got memed out through social media and um but but how did you how did you experience that period of time and, and what was kind of happening with you and your local community mm. well so there was no one really in munich um practicing these sorts of things um, and still now munich um relative to other cities like berlin and germany is still quite underdeveloped let's say in this in this uh in this area so it was just kind of like seeing him on the uh, on the internet now and all of the videos and because i was already a trainer at the crossfit box i would teach a gymnastics class it was supposed to be like a class where you would learn the gymnastics kipping movements and all of that but very soon i found out it's not so enjoyable for me and also the people who were coming they really liked the more uh, playful approach that i was presenting and just messing with this and that so i was kind of putting a little bit of what I saw in videos of, for example, either or in others into the gymnastics class. And we had like a two and a half, three hour thing in the evening, um, creating a little community. And I then quit the job at the CrossFit box because they were moving. And then I was 
like teaching out and about. And um, it was more me bringing really uh, to the people from CrossFit and other areas that I would know from Capoeira, kind of like together we would have jams uh, outside uh, in summer. And I would just invite people and we were, yeah, just jamming with handstands and whatnot. Even one time you also, I know, I think you know him, Craig from uh, Australia. He was once there, Craig Mullet. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Oh, like, um, he was there and like whoever was there I would just invite and we would have these jams playing with gymnastic rings and that was I think 2016, 17, 18 in this in this time frame um, so kind of like organizing jams and somehow bringing people together um, that was kind of the, kind the of vibe the head of the sort of the beginning of of a more diverse movement oriented physical culture around Munich and kind of organizing people from different communities. How did you connect with the Capoeira community? Well, it was, um, I think it was through CrossFit. I met a lot of people because they somehow saw what I was sharing also online about the CrossFit classes I was teaching. They were intrigued because it was not really CrossFit anymore. Yeah. Um, so a lot of people would come there and we would connect there. Um, so I was kind of like going here and there to practice and sometimes visiting like uh, university sports centers. And there were people from all sorts of backgrounds. And I, I guess it was just like talking and connecting. Um, I even visited a couple of Capoeira classes, but really five or not more like that. Um, and just talking to people, I guess, and um, just showing interest. And I guess that was the, the let's say, the recipe for um, for organizing these gems and for having also capoeiristas come and uh, just connect, yeah. Is that kind of jam still happening around Munich or has it... Uh... Now, the thing is, I've been moving um, a lot more since five years. So, um, so sometimes in summertime, I'm still in Munich and I try to organize certain things, right? But the, the, the time from then is, is past, but a lot of other cool things obviously still happen in, in Munich with other friends of mine uh, organizing their own little jams and um, or parkour community and whatever. But like this group is is, is long gone, yeah. Yeah, so how did you, I, I know it seems like fairly recently you've been really exploring the intersection of the floor work and the acrobatics that you do with parkour. Is that an interest that's developed quite recently or is that something that you were exploring, you know, all the way, you know, how, how far back is that? Yeah, I mean, basically in the purest form, I did it as a kid, um, not knowing what, what I was doing, but I still was doing it, obviously. Mm -hmm. But then really just, I guess, the last two, three years, maybe, more and more I became interested. And I guess the, the interest became through me having practiced on floor mm -hmm. for a lot of time. And um, I was kind of like, getting a little bit bored you could say or a little bit searching for other things um and i guess also because i have very good uh, friends from munich who are in parkour community and also uh, will brown who you also met uh, he he dealt yeah. with parkour much more and flynn um so i was kind of like being introduced to this but already for me i was thinking yeah i i really like it but since i have this acrobatic practice why not play more and then through practitioners like um, Matt McCreary or um, Bastian Dratvar or other people who are really showing interesting uh, kind of like yeah, interpretations of parkour um, that got me fired up even more, yeah. Yeah, Matt is, uh, uh, I've been trying to get Matt on the podcast. He's been hesitant, but uh, he's really, really got a unique vision of how we treat parkour as kind of a creative aesthetic exploration in a really beautiful way. I love his stuff. Yeah. Uh, one thing I want to add on top, um, because of the skateboarding background, it's it's very much the similar similarities between my skateboarding and also what I'm doing now in the more parkour uh, discipline, let's say, is very similar. The approach is very similar. Um, so already there in the skateboarding, I had this these ideas, but more with my board, less with my whole body, let's say. So already this... Uh, there was a connection yeah I, I tend to think of skateboarding surfing skiing rollerblading you know mountain biking as, as actually species of parkour 
Um, mm. They're just uh, they're just parkour assisted by an implement. But fundamentally, it's the same. It's it's a, the same process of exploratory locomotor play, where you go out into an environment and you look for intriguing challenges, um, and you take them on. And you know the the affordances in skateboarding are distinct. You know you're not gonna generally you don't vault though. Uh, there's like Will Spencer um, <laughs> who's conging on things and landing on a skateboard on the other side. Uh, William Spencer. Um, so there's, you know, it's possible, but you just see the world a little bit differently when you're on a board than you see it when you're on your feet. And, yeah, definitely. you know, the ability to slide on a board or slide on the, the sides of your your um, rollerblades, et cetera. It's, it switches it, but the but the, the mentality and the kind of the way that you play with it, I think is, is fundamentally very similar. Yeah, definitely. So were you skateboarding kind of, throughout your uh crossfit movement you know floor acrobatics journey uh, and how did you like do you see those as quite separate things or do they sort of start to connect over time how that had that evolution happen because i don't you don't really teach skateboarding as far as i know no um so there's a couple things so um i was skateboarding until i was maybe 16 17 a lot for like six seven years a lot but then when I was going more into the fitness community and CrossFit community, I kind of let go of the practice. And it's interesting thinking back, it's kind of like when I was, I studied also sports science at university while I was doing CrossFit. So I was very much in a more scientific practice mode. So the more artistic side didn't appeal to me so much in this time frame. Um, so I also stopped skateboarding then, um, but then rediscovered it uh, after studying a little bit more with Tom, with Tom Wexler, because he once again, he he remembered me of the, the more artistic side and the more expressive side, like, maybe let's let's call it. And then also the skateboarding made much more sense. So when I picked then up my board again after maybe five, six, seven years of not skateboarding, uh, it, it really changed the way that I skated and made it much more full body, kind of like doing different tricks, thinking about it differently, trying to use the the skills from acrobatics, the soft skills, like all of the, um, the body awareness and whatever you develop in the skateboarding. Um, and since then, I never stopped. I have phases where I skate more or skate less. Um, and definitely, I connected a lot to other practices, like, the, um, for example, what we just talked about in parkour, the way you perceive the world, the environment. It's, it's very similar now. Um, and then also the falling studies that I've been doing a lot, they're very inspired by skateboarding practice, for example. So there is definitely a lot of crossing. Um, and what you mentioned about me not teaching skateboarding, I guess the thing is, I always try to keep my skateboarding really as a pure self-practice, as something purely so I can do it whenever I want to, to kind of like uh, ease my head or just go out and chill. You know, it's really this is the, it's reserved for that. So I never uh, really taught it to someone. Um, I don't also show it so much in the social media because it's really, it's just my thing that I love doing. Um, and also it, it feels very good that it's that pure. Uh, so it's kind of like a resort. I go there like a retreat thing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so so therefore it's not part of the teaching and everything, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. I think like... Uh... Like uh, I think Tom Wexler has a similar relationship to Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, right? Like it's a, something that he's sort of very passionate about, um, but he doesn't. It's not a part of his professional persona at all. Yeah. With the skateboarding, do you interact a lot with the skate community? Do you have like a friendship group, a, a you know people you go to and connect with in skateboarding specifically, or is it more something that you do really as a solo practice? Mm, more so solo. I've been talking with many friends about this because, of course, I, I know a lot of skaters and a lot of friends in Munich that would also skate, but I never really fully dove into the community of skateboarding. Um, and there is different reasons. One is because I like skateboarding and that's the biggest thing. I just like to be on my board and skate. And then if there is cool people, cool. But there is no necessity for me to really go in the community. Uh, also, one thing is that a lot of skaters um maybe you can you can um feel this more from parkour there are certain people certain types of people maybe are more drawn to a certain discipline 
and yeah. in skateboarding there is a lot of uh, like specific people that I really like but I don't feel actually super connected to them because of different maybe upbringing different experiences there can be a lot of harshness in skateboarding and the people sometimes like yeah. fuck it mentality yeah and this is not something that I, that I that I really have so much so there's also a little bit of I like skateboarding community but I I don't feel so connected yeah it's interesting you say that because I think about how kind of movement cultures in some sense they they often become kind of connected to other aspects of a subculture right like mm. um skateboarding and parkour obviously share a lot but in the early days of parkour uh skateboarders were very negative towards parkour because it um it reminded them of freestyle walking which was basically like skateboarding without a skateboard so you know there's a very dismissive attitude from the whole extreme sport community really towards parkour in the first few years that i was practicing mm -hmm. and the parkour community in the beginning you know it was a lot of kids who were on the internet they were pretty idealistic and it had a very different cultural feel right a lot of us were really attracted to the idea of be strong to be useful mm -hmm. it's kind of very pro-social approach and skateboarding you know really developed a punk ethos in the 1980s and 1990s and it took on uh, a very specific sort of gen x punk um nihilistic culture that mm -hmm. a lot of us in the early days of parkour were really i would say kind of trying to be at the opposite end of and we also saw how skateboarding had alienated the general public in a way that made it really difficult for skateboarding to actually even be accessible and so you know, parkour, we wanted to, a lot of the early early adopters of parkour, I think that we wanted to sort of chart a different path where we were creating much more of a positive um, relationship to the community. And there were there were communities in parkour early on who had kind of a more of a skateboarding ethos and we were, we were not happy about that, right? Because they were they were alienating the public and making it more difficult for people to practice. Mm. So I think that's interesting that you, you've experienced that. And I think it's just interesting how how we have, uh, how those cultures tend to go together, right? Like, like if someone does CrossFit, there's a good chance that they're kind of politically libertarian. Um, and if someone does yoga, there's a good chance that they're sort of new agey spiritual, right? Now, those are such big tents that, uh, that you know, there's lots and lots and lots of people who don't conform to those stereotypes. But it becomes not just a thing to practice, but a way to find people who have common values, right? It's like if you want to go meet people in a town who, who've also read Eckhart Tolle and Thich Nhat Hanh, like you, you go, you go to a yoga studio, right? Yeah, um, definitely. And I, so I think people underestimate how much that actually matters, and and kind of in some ways is a major aspect of why people choose specific practices, whatever the value of the practice is. A lot of times it's as much about the social environment that's created around the practice. And, and I think there's a lot of randomness about why, you know, why the social environment ends up as it is. It's like parkour spread through YouTube and online forums, which created a very different early adopter group than the VHS tapes, um, you know, kind of underground stuff that was happening in, in skateboarding yeah definitely i mean just what you are saying if you go to a to a climbing or bouldering gym nowadays you can expect very laid back vibes yeah <laughs> so definitely there's like the the culture that is somehow forming around disciplines and and also in dance culture which i'm not very deep into it whatsoever but still i i, I have a lot of friends there and there's like certain people that you that you meet on certain topics that you would speak more about or certain ideas that you would speak about more which is it's very interesting yeah mm -hmm. so tell me about how you you know i guess i was listening to another podcast with you and you're talking a little bit about what what it is that you're focusing on in your teaching and in your practice and you use the term acrobatics um, and I think the, you have a very interesting definition of acrobatics that I'd love you to get into. But as I kind of look at it, I would divide what you do up into sort of a floor work practice and a um, 
and a acrobatic practice and then um and then you know a real orientation towards flow like the the quality of flow in movement and you said that you know a big pivot for you was encountering tom's work and the way that he moved so you can talk a little bit about how that shifted for you as you came from maybe this more general movement slash general fitness approach into seeing something in in that style of movement that that calls something from you or for you right and um, i guess what is quite important to state also now uh, at this point is that um, while of course all of the floor based things and the flow and all of that is very interesting to me it's it's definitely part of my teaching, but like one of the core things um, that uh, that I'm after in my teaching, and that also now the what I will tell about like what changed then meeting Tom is really important is that through meeting Tom I was reminded of something that I was truly inspired by. So I saw him move and I was I was like yes exactly this is what I want right, and the sensation of clarity of what I want is amazing and uh, to me as a person as a human as a practitioner as a teacher this is amazing to have like wow that feels amazing i want more of that i'm so interested i want to go deeper and this is one of the core aspects that i have in my teaching with my students or with the participants in workshops i i kind of want to help them find this for themselves and if in the end that's the flow practice and the flow and all of that great but if it's something else that is much more important to me so this is kind of like one of the the core things that i hold true to my my teaching this um, finding out kind of what you like, uh, who you are, what you resonate with, how how you learn. So more like this uh, self inquiry, self exploration type of things. So I guess this is this is really the core. Um, and I guess this is also then when I was meeting Tom and uh, his work. This was something truly like uh, um, like a very strong sensation because I really felt like wow, this is actually. How I want to move. This is this is super fascinating. Now the context is I was moving years before that in a very generalized way. Now I was running. I was trying to uh, lift weights. I was trying to do gymnastics. I was trying to go to uh, martial arts classes and all of that with this idea of generalization somehow. And then through Tom, I I once again got reminded of like yes, all of that is cool, but this really speaks to you, and this is something really interesting, and. Um, it kind of like, I see it like this. I was going more to the generalized idea of moving and all of that, which I still hold hold dear. And it's in interesting and important to me. But certain things, they're so important to me. And I, I have so much passion. So I want to go there more. And this was kind of like one of the big um, revelations, I guess, that I had uh, meeting Tom's work. And then obviously, because I was so interested in all of that, I also spent much more time practicing this and also then bit by bit putting it into my teaching because I was so intrigued by it. And this is something nowadays that I still do. If there is something that I'm very interested in, I go there and I research it and I try to spend a lot of time there. And very naturally, this also will somehow become part of my teaching just because I'm so interested in it. And um yeah, I guess that's uh, that's that's uh, one answer to your question there. Yeah, I was listening to you I, uh, on um, the Passive Hang podcast, and I found it really interesting, your exploration of what you've given up as far as being a movement generalist as well. And um, I, I think we, uh, we'll come back to that in a moment, but this idea of the, the specialist and the generalist or the, the pursuit of joy versus the pursuit of an ideal or the pursuit of uh, utility has been very interesting to me throughout the years, right? Like I, uh, I have pursued being a movement generalist to a very high degree, right? Um, my parkour skills are pretty wide. I've played a lot with ground flow and dance and uh, I'm a very skilled martial artist. <clears throat> I've, you know, still have pretty good barbell strength, pretty good gymnastic strength, you know, well, maybe not pretty good gymnastic strength for a 220 pound guy, decent gymnastic strength. Um, you know, I can juggle a little bit. I can do a lot of things and 
why I'm very passionate about the idea of what actually creates the movement generalist, right? Like it's, it's not enough to just go do a bunch of different things. You actually want to create things that, um, that have a certain relationship between them that scales up the ability to, uh, to react well to novel situations because you can't train everything. So if you can't train everything, then you need to train the things that are the highest priority and that work together the best to create a generalizable ability that you can then use to um, to adapt to any new thing. And that's a that's a concept that I've spent you know a lot of years putting my time and effort into. And but I think the practices that we've developed involved with play is very very profound for. At the same time, I've also specialized in movement in nature and movement in trees, right, for a long time. And now that I'm in my 40s and I find that my my desire to go do martial arts and stuff is, is a little bit lower, it, it feels less important to me to be this generalist. It feels more... Like, okay, I've, 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 I've pioneered that landscape, um, but what's actually going to bring me joy and make it sustainable for me to take these things on throughout my life and be able to do it in such a way that it's donating to my life, you know? Ido said something I really like. He said, we're a human first, a mover second, and a specialist third. And I think that very often we, we get lost at the layer of the specialist or the layer of the mover, and we forget that ultimately it's to the, the development of the human. Mm. Part of that development of the human is really what it's not so much like you can you can think about the utility of different skills that you're working on, but there's a kind of characterological or role in your life, right? It's like skateboarding might not have any specific utility to you as far as tasks that you would do in life, but it has a very specific utility in allowing you to access a flow state which changes your experience of the world that then changes how you're able to show up in other situations. Mm. So it's a kind of tool, right? The practice becomes a tool, um, not for what you do in the world, but for how you shift yourself so that you can do other things in the world. Yeah. So this is kind of the, an area that I'm thinking a lot about right now is how do we recognize um, what we want to to pay the cost to carry forward hmm. and what do we recognize as okay that's something i had but it's not important to me anymore or to who i want to be and how do i let go of it and let myself lean towards joy what i always tell people when they're trying to scale up a practice you know i look at the practice that i've created and it's so holistic and so huge and it's like well you can't start with all of it you'll just get overwhelmed where do you start and i always tell people try to find the thing that you love and then you'll be able to go add things to it because they 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 offer something you know i don't strength train anymore because i love strength training i strength train because it helps me do parkour right mm. So yeah, I'm curious to hear you kind of respond about how you've approached that and how you consider your own relationship to the generalist and 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 this the joy aspect and the self self development aspect. How movement plays to that and how you're approaching that with the students you work with. Hmm. Yeah, very interesting, um, and also like a big question and uh, different thoughts there. But I guess. And one thought that I would like to start with is this idea of I have different interests and one of them is researching what it is to be a movement generalist. Another interest of mine is to research what it is to be a specialist. Mm -hmm. And because I know I have these different um, interests, I need to allow myself to, to research them bit by bit. And of course, if I'm a movement generalist, I can't at the same time uh, research what a specialist is, right? So I need to have different time frames. And I guess um, this is one big thing that I try to do. And I also try to work on with students is this idea of if you're interested in one thing right now, do it, do it fully. Mm -hmm. If you want to now go the generalist route and do a little bit of strength, a little bit of this and that, go there. And naturally, maybe there will come a time where the interest will start to shift more to 
being a little bit more specific again. So then we go there. And uh, really following interest is one is one one big thing there. Mm. And then also kind of like seeing this idea of generalization and specialization um, in this perspective of kind of like waves going like this in a way. And I noticed throughout my life that I would have phases where I need a little bit more uh, specific practices, a little bit more clarity in what I'm doing. For example, I don't know if something in uh, like um, something happens, uh, circumstances that I that I need to deal with, which are a little bit hard in the outside world. I tend to narrow my perspective in practice a little bit more. So that's a good time to focus more on the like specific times now. And other times I feel so good and and open and also have this lust to openness that I would allow myself to open again, uh, back out again. So instead of having this mindset of seeing either or, um, or you can only do this, right? I know that naturally I'm going through these phases where I would sometimes need a little bit more openness, sometimes a little bit more closeness in a way and being okay with that. Um, I guess that was a big learning for me and something also that I now uh, try to work on with students. Uh, interestingly enough is that a lot of the students that I have right now is people that um, have been spending a lot of time more in the open approach, the generalistic they have impressive strength skills, they have impressive mobility, they have impressive this and that and all of that. But somehow they now feel they they need to find something that they're truly passionate about, like kind of closing back in again, right? And um, it's very interesting for me to be in a, in a role like this currently where I can help people because I've also went through the same same process of kind of like going from this very open mindset to something a little bit more narrow again mm -hmm. and and very interesting enough also is and you know it's from from parkour or tree climbing the deeper you go into a practice the more you see how it once again goes up again no mm -hmm. so you go very deep into acrobatics or anything really and you see that it's not just this thing but it's so many things so you know there is this this constant uh, curve very naturally also if you go very deep into one thing yeah, I, I thought about this years ago that the, the way I described it was that a practice should sort of have phases of widening and deepening, right? And that the, the kind of optimal practice for me isn't a practice that is perfectly generalized and it's not a practice that's super specialized. Um, so widening for me is when you are when you're going out and kind of experiencing things that are less central to your practice and deepening is when you sort of hone your attention down on something that's very specific to your practice so like for me the last couple of years really as i recovered from the intensity of covid and a lot of other things have been really like kind of very focused on parkour and you know i haven't done capoeira or dance or you know many other practices i've been really like just wanting to uh reclaim some of the parkour skill that I lost due to injury and illness and stress. And it's just like, okay, I don't like not being able to do the stuff that I can do. And it makes me happy to be able to do it. And right now I think I'm maybe just opening a little bit, but when you open, you find that, that there's, there's insights in these other practices that donate to whatever your primary practices are. And then when you deepen, you find that there's, there's, there's a certain way in which when you're taking on many different things, you can't see as kind of, you can't kind of study as deeply. And when you have that experience of like, okay, I'm just going to really, really tune myself into this. Um, it really, it gives you a certain type of insight that's harder when you're more broadly spread. One way I've thought about it is, um, well, I've noticed that, I call it the problem of the generalist and the problem of the specialist, right? So very often people who are kind of attracted to just being very general, they're uh, they're quite talented and they do very well in the novice phase. And so they can kind of get good at a lot of things pretty quickly. And then they can kind of play in many different arenas. But there's a stage at which it's not easy to get good at anything, no matter how talented you are, you kind of reach a stage where it, it becomes a grind to try to reach the next, the next level. And so I think for certain people, you, they reach the grind stage in anything, and then it's just easier to go try something new. 
So it's like, mm. okay, you know, maybe you were skateboarding and you were pretty good among your skateboarding crew, but your skateboarding crew, now there's a couple guys who are really, really dialing in and they're super passionate and they're, and they're getting, they're doing stuff that's now really scary and it's hard and you just kind of don't want to do the work to stick with them. So you, you pick up snowboarding and you find out, okay, that's pretty easy too. And, and you, you go through the same cycle. And I enjoy very often to hang out with people who have that sort of thing because they, they're down for whatever. But then there's a, it feels like there's a certain shallowness to the practice. There's a certain lack of like deep, like awareness of self that's been cultivated through the practice. And then the flip side I see is people who, who sort of select one practice. A lot of times they, they find the startup phase. They're either not so physically talented or they just have more anxiety about trying new things. That may be even more of it is the idea of like, some people don't mind looking silly to start, right? But some people find that really hard. And so the once they've kind of conned on to their thing and they've developed some skill and they have their arena that they're comfortable in, they don't want to step outside of it. And so they'll often have like a really sort of profound relationship to that primary practice, but their perspective feels very narrow. And so I try to try to toggle between those modes, right? In the same kind of wave form that you were describing. And I think that there's a way in which that is actually more developmental than getting stuck in either the generalist, I have to be exactly the perfect uh, avatar of a human mover or the, mm -hmm. this is my practice and nothing else matters. Right. Yeah. I mean, I guess there's, there's also uh, people on the, the outskirts of the snow who really feel comfortable in one thing and they simply don't want to go into the, let's say the other uh, mm -hmm. perspective. And that's super fine. No, but I guess uh, if you're somehow drawn to a little bit more different things, then you would definitely, uh, I think, um, um yeah take a lot of good benefits from sometimes changing a little bit these routes and uh, i notice for myself for example i i need to do that um sometimes more often sometimes less often sometimes i i seem to be in one thing and i wonder if if that is it if i'm forever there now but then no life happens and i i somehow am drawn to something else again so yeah, yeah. for me like when i um In my 20s, when I was really developing parkour and kind of very focused on sort of understanding what parkour was and how to spread it and how to have a pedagogy around it and then how to support people in achieving goals and it taking a lot uh, on a lot of thinking from sports science and, uh, you know, athletic development, it became very much about reaching goals. And then that burned out i burned out because i took on goals that were too ambitious and tried to do too many things at once and i injured myself and and then my goals ended up somehow not being motivated with my aligned with my motivations so my goal was to win parkour competitions and all the parkour competitions had moved indoors but what i enjoyed was training in nature and so mm. the, the transferability of the nature training to the indoor competitions was not so high and so i had this conflict in myself of like well my my muse, my interest is over here in the trees, but my stated goals, my explicit goals are in the gym. And I ended up choosing to, to go with my muse. And that was really, really powerful. And I progressed very, very fast for a period of time when I let go of goals for a while. Mm, and yeah, then yeah. I found myself on the other side of sort of my practice being too chaotic. There was no real guiding principle behind it. It was just sort of show up and feel into what feels good and somehow that became unsatisfactory and then i found myself getting injured again right there was like this calibration between following the muse it's finding the interest and seeking the joy and then saying okay but you know there is a day you know today i'm practicing but also i'm going to be practicing hopefully in six months and if i practice today just for what is joyful in this moment then I won't have the same options to experience joy necessarily in the future. And so I have to have this, okay, but what, what am I doing now for my future self? Right. And what kind of options am I giving that future self who might, might find themselves in a different place as far as where their interests are. 
So this is the place where it became really viable to me to start orienting towards this ideal, right? Like thinking about movement practice as no longer simply serving um, to achieve like specific goals within the practice, but as actually serving the development of my character and then asking, how does this practice participate in that, right? If I'm doing parkour, Am I doing it just because I enjoy it or is it because it's, it's helping me cultivate something that I need, I need for how I show up in the rest of my life. Yeah. So that's really been a place that I've, I've been in. And so I, the idea of, of just seeking the interest for me and my experience, there was a point at which that sort of was like, ah, but that's not actually enough. There has to be, I have to have a, an overarching philosophy that guides the the kind of balance between what's interesting in the moment and who I might want to be in the future, if that makes sense. Definitely. Um, I'm just reminded by um, like a, a concept, that, concept that I made for myself to kind of like uh, figure all of these things out. I called it uh, like navigating the jungle of opportunities. And it was basically my search for how can I navigate all of the interests, all of the things that are there? How can I nav navigate this? without being stuck in this very two tunnel vision type thing or being lost in all of the opportunities. And I figured like, um, before figuring something out where I want to go, I, I need to kind of like have a status quo. Who am I? What are my limitations now? So kind of like figure out what is that? And then, um, and this is then also referring to what you were saying, is this, um, I made four categories. One of the things is the, the must do's. What are things that I must do in order to achieve whatever I want to know? It could be uh, doing my tax. It could be, um, I don't know, like in physical practice, I need to do somehow some form of strength training. So these are really must do. So I need to do them. There is no, no option, basically, and I do them. Then there is the things that I want to do. So following my interest now, and definitely I want to give this a lot of space and a lot of time. But then also, like you were saying, it's, Sometimes it's not enough to only follow interest. So there is also what I call the third category, the supports. What things are maybe not so joyful, but they really support what I want to achieve, what I want to be or live. And yeah. um, I guess this category maybe takes a little bit more discipline to do, but I know it really supports what I want to do. And yeah. then there is the last category, um, which is the should do's. So all of the things that pressure from uh, social media may maybe uh, like would say you need to be able to do your splits and a double weight back squat or whatever it is and then notice these uh, should do's and try to eliminate eliminate most of them and focus more on the categories before so that was kind of like a, a little things uh, thing that I wanted to share regarding this yeah yeah I think that's a great a great heuristic I was just thinking about applying that um, within my parkour practice right so kind of where I'm at in my life right now with a variety of different things. There's not as much energy right now for my, on my practice. And I need, I need my practice to be something that I'm really enjoying. So, okay. I want, I want to enjoy it. So what, so what if I went in and I, I was really oriented towards joy, but I, I still want to keep my options open, right? I still want to be able to, to make sure that I have the capacity to, to sustain skills and to grow. So it's like, what is the kind of minimum number of supports, as you said, that, that mm -hmm. will keep me sort of having a sense of really being able to step in and play the game whenever I want. And so for instance, uh, a skill like a cast up to standing on a bar, it's not particularly fun to do, right? I don't get a lot of joy out of it but it opens a lot of options for me right? and I need, you know, so basically mounting up on narrow surfaces in a variety of ways, something I got to like stick to being able to pull myself quickly up and over things. It just makes parkour so much more enjoyable to not get stuck and struggle with that. Mm -hmm. Being able to hit the ground while striding on things, you know, so there's these, these little sort of like, if I, if I maintain these, then a lot of other things can kind of come and go as a form of play. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but what are those things within a practice? That's the that's the question that <clears throat> is really useful to to ask. You know, what am I? What am I? Or, or more broadly, something like cardiorespiratory ability, right? It's like it's super important for your health, and if you want to practice anything, not getting tired when you're practicing has a huge impact. So it might be the case that just doing some, you know, zone two cardio very regularly is just it's not really a joyful or interest or muse oriented part of your practice, but you just do it because. You keep the, your options open by doing it. Mm -hmm. So those are some some thoughts that I had in, in response to that. So you have your, can you give me the four again? Yeah, so it's the must-dos. Must-dos, yeah. It is the want-to-dos, yeah. so following the interest. It's the supports, and it's the should-dos. Yeah, so must-dos are like, you know, if I'm teaching a seminar coming up and I have, uh, I need to cover certain material, I got to make sure that I'm, I'm, uh, ready to share that material you know can't exactly. can't lose the, the capacity to do something that i have to teach um, right. there is no question you simply must do it and you will do it yeah yeah there you go okay i like those and yeah and then there's so much i think it's so funny how these memes propagate through the the movement community and become like things that everyone's like oh you gotta do, do you really have to squat double body weight um i don't think most people do um I don't, I don't think most people need a 60 second handstand, right? Um, or a full split are certainly not a, you know, a head to toe stretch. I never had it, but I'm, I'm still alive somehow. So I guess I made it. <laughs> but people get, get trapped in them, you know, like we're, we're all, we're all subject to the memetics of desire, right? We see, we see a bunch of other people desiring something and we, we, we acquire that desire in ourselves. But that can be something that can be very misleading and delusional. So I, I, this is not the best bridge, but it's something I wanted to ask you about. You talked in the passive hang about how you've sacrificed a lot of your strength goals that they've kind of receded and you, you don't mind no longer having access to some of those things because not only do, do they not support your goals, but you were even feeling like they were actually in the way of your goals, which was quite interesting to me. So you can talk about your relationship to strength training and, um, you know, how it contributes to or competes with the goals of your primary practice. Hmm. Well, so at the time when I was practicing much more strength, um, I, I really did a lot, like from kettlebell to Olympic lifting to gymnastic strength, like many different things, climbing. And um, I guess through the practice of strength training, I got stuck in a little habit of um, overly tensing my body in certain circumstances because it is useful in strength training, but in more dynamic practices, it's not that useful at all. Mm -hmm. um, so it's kind of like forming a habit, no? And I perceive this in people who are spending a lot of time in strength training and only that there seems to be this habit of the body tensing, forcing. Um, of course, there's also different schools who, who teach it a little bit better, but generally I think this is a, is a thing that happens. And it also happened to me. So when I watch videos from back then moving and not only in acrobatics, but also in skateboarding, I saw or I can still see some sort of rigidity some sort of holding in my body right which um yeah was not so desired and i remember there was this moment um i guess 2017 18 19 something like this uh, at one of the workshops uh, that tom was teaching and um i don't remember the exact conversation but i was doing something and he was like ah you're too strong you're doing it with too much force something like this and it was not only him saying this but i heard it a lot and i also perceived it there is like i'm doing the technique but i'm overusing strength in uh, like when i was learning gymnastics kips because i could do the muscle ups from crossfit all of the gymnastic teachers were like yes but let go you know um so then i really figured you know what because i i really want to go down this path of acrobatics and all of that let go of strength because i have so much um let go and it was also a good timing because more of my passion 
start to uh, to be inspired by the acrobatics. So it was not so hard also uh, on giving up. It was not like that I loved it so much, the strength training, and I, I needed to stop it. But it was like, okay, you know what? I just dropped it. And then for maybe three years, I really didn't do any form of proper strength training, uh, but focused on the other side maybe of the coin more, if you can say that. So instead of this holding habit, I tried to find more and more this letting go habit. And very interestingly enough, now when I see people from contact improv or certain dance practices, I see a lot of that. And then also maybe for other practices that I want to do, a lack of holding again. So just as a funny side note. Um, so yeah, that was kind of like a, um, a, a big shift in my practice, letting go all of the strength that I've been doing for over 10 years, I guess, and focusing more on letting go, focusing more on internal sensation of feeling connected and all of that uh, which is more interesting in acrobatics dance improvisational aspects um, but i've been doing more and more strength training again because i definitely think everything can go hand in hand mm -hmm. and also an acrobatic very fluid flowy practice can very much go hand in hand with strength training but now my uh, approach is a little bit different i'm experiencing mu experimenting much more I'm dabbling more with more, I, I say organic, but I don't mean it in a very strict way, but more organic forms of strength training, allowing my body to move much more in strength scenarios. And I've been also enjoying the sensation of holding again much more after a couple of years. Um, and like with the strength, um, what I'm saying now about the strength, letting go of that, there were different other aspects, uh, certain skills that I also needed to let go of. Um, for example, maybe because we're also talking a bit about acrobatics, um, I was practicing a lot handstands and basically the, the basic position of, of inversion, inversion, so straight arms and pushing tall and all of that. And I figured out that in acrobatics, it's not so useful, actually. It's very rigid, this type of pushing, this specific skill. So in acrobatics, I need something much more malleable, something much more dynamic. Um, so also needed to let go of the, the skill of handstand that I was doing back then in order to learn a different form of handstand, let's say. So there's a, a lot of letting go of certain skills, certain ideas, concepts in order, in order to learn something new, which is more helpful to what I'm passionate about now. Yeah. So you have, um, you know, a traditional sort of, is it a circus style handstand where you have the super straight body lines, super super elevated uh you know what is it shoulders super elevated right mm. the idea is that this is correct technique but it's not correct from the perspective of it it um is easier to sustain it's correct because it looks a certain way mm. right yeah but what you're pointing out is something interesting which is what is the correct technique of the handstand that best opens the potential for movement into and out of it in a specific way. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I haven't thought about that too much. I, I gave up handstanding. Uh, mm -hmm. I got to the 30-second handstand um, and realized that I didn't see any transfer to the parkour training that was important to me and just stopped. And then for years, I would kick up into a handstand and be like, man, I'm really struggling to to hold and I'm like, well, I guess it just doesn't matter. And recently I've actually played with it a little bit. And for some reason, all of a sudden I'm finding the holding much easier. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, who knows why. But it's, a, it's such an interesting thing because it's such a core skill to a lot of how we think about movement. And I think it's a nice thing to have, but I don't think that there is, there's, I don't think that, there's that far down the pathway of handstands you need to go to have a very generalizable movement capacity that you can express in many, many ways. Yeah, I think so. Um, I mean, once again, if there is a lot of passion for you there, a lot of joy, definitely go for it. But in terms of maybe usability, in my experience in these acrobatic fields, um, it's 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 not so important. I know very good acrobats who are not capable of holding very long or circus style, gymnastic style, beautiful handstands. Um, 
it could be useful and definitely some acrobats some people in this realm they they have a very nice style because they are using a handstand more in their acrobatics so it's also what you want to do then for example in acrobatics i for example i like to be on my hands i like to manipulate my body on my hands so i i i spend more time on my hands but it's not a necessity right um it's also not the more standard handstand but i use a lot of bent elbows a lot of weird arm positions that allow to me to pull and push and redirect motions so i find a lot of interest there so therefore i i keep practicing the handstand but in a different perspective a different light i guess yeah it's not a standard gymnastics or circus handstand but if you look at how handstanding is used in b-boy or capoeira it's not so different yeah. um Acrobatics. We mentioned the fact this is kind of where you're 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 specialized in, but we've never actually. I haven't at this point really gotten you to to describe what acrobatics is to you and like what you're trying to to offer people when you you speak about acrobatics. Yeah, uh, I want to show two perspectives. Um, first off, inspired by skateboarding, um, when I am on my skateboard, I only need a small curb, something like ten centimeters high, to have two hours of pure fun yeah. because I see the opportunities in that thing. It maybe is not something big. It is maybe not grindable. So you can't grind or slide on it, but you can really just do basic things, but in many variations. And that is extremely fun for me. And ac acrobatics is exactly that. You don't need a huge skill set. You don't need a backflip, a cartwheel, a forward cartwheel, a walkover, all of that. You just need a very basic understanding of, how to manipulate your body going in interesting shapes and you can do endless things you can circle you can swirl you can dive down you can go up you can find all of these things and this is really this is this is my deepest nature fiddling with things and figuring out what else i can do um so that is something that you can do with acrobatics for years for for months for uh, yeah decades i guess um, so that's one perspective, like this kind of like figuring out and experimenting and uh, rediscovering, constantly refining. Uh, this process is something that through acrobatics we can we can learn a lot. And mm -hmm. one acro uh, one perspective that I really enjoy. Another perspective that also is inspired by Tom and also other people is this idea of acrobatics, not as a skill set but as a way to relate to risk, uncertainty, and fear. You know? uh, a lot of people, they, they connect acrobatics to, to scary situations, to flipping, uh, to going into crazy positions and all of that. And very naturally, there is also this idea of it must be risky. There must be, it must be scary, right? And I think acrobatics is a very safe tool in order to explore exactly that. Uh, what is risk? What is fear? How does it feel? Um, something that also in parkour you can do beautifully, but also in acrobatics. And um, so instead of having this idea of acrobatics and skills, it's more like acrobatics as something very explorative and something which is a very nice tool to, to explore risk and fear. And I think already this are two huge perspectives that many people not only would benefit from hugely, but also are extremely fun. And uh, yeah. I found that interesting. You you mentioned that that idea of acrobatics as a study of fear um, in the in the interview I was listening to. And I found that interesting because you know, parkour is very much that, right? But then we distinguish in parkour between the kind of pure parkour skills and the acrobatic skills. Mm -hmm. But even there, the 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 um the relationship is quite interesting, right? So, you know, if you want to train really for utility, maybe you run and you sprint and you do big jumps and you work on precise footwork and you work on getting up and down things really fast and being able to hit the ground safely. Um, some vaults, some strides, some hurdles. But I think a lot of utility in parkour would really be running and jumping, you know, and running, jumping, climbing. And then, you know, most people who practice parkour, we do some traditional acrobatic skills, skills that come from uh, gymnastics were a big part of, of the kind of the early repertoire of parkour athletes. So front flips, back flips, side flips. Um, 
round off cartwheel uh, cartwheel to, uh, to full twisting side uh, side flip right is a very very common skill and then then there are skills that come out of tricking corkscrews a twists b twists um, and now you're seeing skills that come out of like snowboarding cork zeros and some of these really weird inversions and finding you know dimensions of rotation right so one way that i've thought about it is that acrobatics for me is playing with inverting the body and rotating the body when we don't necessarily need to invert or rotate the body and uh and a lot of people in parkour who are quite purists about parkour who don't like to do the traditional gymnastics stuff they actually spend a lot of time playing with flow which is essentially acrobatics that is a little bit less airborne right because you don't you know you don't need to spin around the bar right you know you know do a a palm spin on the bar and then a spin up on top of the bar and then drop down and you know uh, there's a beautiful video if anyone wants to see the style of parkour uh by min uh m-i-n-h can't remember but the name i'll try and find it and put it in the show notes but he's just playing on this one set of rails for a long time and it's like it's 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 a micro acrobatic practice is the way I would think of it, or a soft acrobatic practice, but just with a rail. Mm, sure. Um, and and then you know you have uh, in Sistema they talk about the break falls as ground acrobatics. Mm -hmm. Think about Capoeira and all the very Capoeira and B boy have all these strength skills that are you know, hands fixed on the ground or, you know, move through hands fixed on the ground. So you're not rotating in an airborne fashion, somersaulting, but you are, you're taking your body through very strange spaces, you know, which require a lot of strength and they don't have much in the way of direct functional utility, right? You're not, you're, you're not going to, you don't really need to do a major lua ies to um to do anything in a martial arts context right it's 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 there for fun yeah so i, I find that that perspective of it interesting but there's something for me because the study of fear is something that i see in parkour and i see in acrobatics but they're not exactly the same but there's a there's a there's a I suppose that I think of acrobatics as what the first thing you mentioned though is a kind of like lateral creativity, right? It's the ability to find new purposes for something, new potentials within something. And that's a lot of what we're doing, both in parkour and acrobatic practices. But like I'll take my my 11 year old daughter to the gym, you know, to the parkour, uh, that local parkour ninja gym, and she'll try out the new routes or whatever's available. And then she'll tell me, I'm bored, there's nothing to do. And I'm like, dude, you can't essentially say that. Like, there's a million things to do. You could, you could just play with this one thing forever. You just have to open the mind, right? And that capacity to, to have access to something like that creatively, I think, is is enormously valuable. So, I don't know. I'm just kind of musing on, on what is an acrobatic practice and how does it relate to to parkour or to skateboarding or to something else and where where is the lines there and what is the what is the what is the thing that we are gaining from engaging with the practice what a, what is the you know yeah no i understand well for example skateboarding i guess it's purely acrobatic because the ter in terms of usability of course you can use a skateboard to go from one from place 1 to to place b um but everything else, like flying down stairs and grinding, sliding, it's. I I guess it's acrobatics. Also, it's um, um, the the thing itself is meaning. The thing itself is fun. The thing itself is the is the thing, mm. um, and acrobatics also. A lot of this is 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 really true. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Play is described as autotelic, right? Uh, as in it, the the thing is the is the point right you do the thing just because it's the point why do you do the backflip because it's fun to do a backflip right why do you do the macaco it's fun to do the backflip why do you explore 30 different variations of the macaco because 
it's just rewarding to do it. Mm. Yeah. Um, just curious where, what, where we go from there. So you're teaching acrobatics and you've even been exploring the intersection of, of acrobatics and parkour. I, I believe you've taught a couple of, of workshops where those things are are interacting. Where where is your interest sort of moving towards at this stage of your 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 development? Hmm. Right now, which like specific practices, disciplines you mean? Yeah, yeah. I'm just curious. Like we've been talking about your history, but where do you what's on the horizon for you? Well. I guess right now I'm in a phase where I am enjoying simply my my practice. I don't have very specific goals. Um, I guess right now I'm really in a phase of opening up a little bit more, not so much to learning many different things, but to just explore my practice and just being in the mode of I just do a thing and I do it because I like it. I don't have too many ambitions currently with it. It's really a very, let's say, a very chill practice. So um whenever I get the chance to to play with acrobatics, I, I will do it, especially with friends and my partner also. It's it's very enjoyable for me. Um, when I get a chance and I have a very nice spot where I can also interact with the environment and do a little bit of parkour and kind of merge it, I would simply do it. But currently I'm in a very, let's say, content state uh, in my practice where there's nothing on the horizon, which is really um, like a big thing for me. I'm in a state of like, yeah, this is uh, this is what I do. And currently I'm happy, I guess, also because um, outside of practice are a couple of things are currently happening and uh, moving country, planning a, a, a workshop tour in the in the United States. So there's a couple of external factors from my practice, which has a, have a little bit more goal orientation right now. So in practice, I'm very, um, yeah, just very, just very, very happy where I am. Uh, right now, I guess. Yeah, that's a good place to be. So if folks are interested in your work, they find you, just your name on Instagram, YouTube, um, anywhere else they should find you. Uh, well, I you can simply put the name into the search engine and you will see where it pops up. But it's basically this year, uh, YouTube is going to be bigger and uh, much more content there. And I mean, all of the, the Instagram and the website, but you can find everything uh, basically by just typing the name and uh, results will pop up. On Google. Uh, and you have a number of online courses available and you have a workshop series. Is, do you only in the United States or do you have uh, dates coming up in Europe as well? They will for sure come from May onwards, but for now nothing planned because the priority is now the, the US tour. And, but for sure, everything will be announced soon and to be found on all the, the social media channel, channels as well, yeah. Sweet. I think that's all the questions I have for you today, Neil. It was really good to, to get a chance to reconnect and I look forward to the next time that we're able to play in person. I, I want to do some tree acrobatics with you. Yeah, looking forward. Cheers, Ray. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.